the people standing at the mouth of Thondaman River were watching until Prince Aromas Hivarmar reached Parthipendra's ship. As soon as the prince boarded the ship, the boat that had taken him returned. His face showed that Senate Hapati Buthavikramaksari was elated. The Lord is in our party, no doubt. Will the Sanguskakra insignia on the prince's Tirumana perish? Parthibendra will take him safely to Kanchi and join him. We must march with our forces towards Tanjore. Kajumbalar Velar said aloud as if he were saying to himself. Immediately he looked at Alwarkadian next to him. Vaishnava! Are you standing here? So there is no harm. What is there that the Prime Minister's intimates do not know? Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to come with me to Matadam? He asked. No, sir. I have one more job to do that the First Minister gave me. What is it, Dad? Alvar Kadayan looked at the place where the dumb queen and Pungazali were standing. The thing about those girls, said the commander. It is about one of them, the Prime Minister has ordered that if such a mute woman should be seen in Ceylon, she should be brought to Tanjavur by any means. He gave you a good job. He might have told you to catch one of the gales that blow in the Ceylon seas. It would have been easier to catch that mute woman. She is a stranger. She has a great admiration for our prince. Do you know anything about her? I know she's dumb and born deaf. I know it's easier to cage storm wind than to take her away. Yet I'll make an effort as my master says. This runner girl and she seem to be friends too. Look at the two of them talking through their glasses. Call that girl over here. I want to give her a warning. Alwarkadayan went near the women and told Pungazali that Sinadipati was calling. Pungazali left the dumb queen and approached Sinadipati. He said, Look, girl. You are very intelligent. You came at the right time and gave important news. You have done a great help to the Kolakula. I will never forget this. I will give you a suitable gift at the right time. Pungajali humbly said, Greetings, sir. I don't need anything as a gift. If you don't need it, who will let it go? Let all this chaos settle down a little. Then, then I will marry you as a hero in the Chola army. It is not enough if the husband you want is insignificant. He must be Bhimasena. If not, won't you put a finger in his eye and make him go away? The commander said and smiled. Punghuali stood looking at the ground. Anger flared inside her. But I don't want to show it yet. What's the point of picking a fight with this old rascal? She tried to control her anger. But remember one thing, don't think you can celebrate the prince's success because you've done him a favor. Stop fishing in the sea with your nets. Don't be tempted to catch the prince with your nets. Beware, girl. You'll be in danger if he gets too close. Said the commander. His voice was very harsh then. Every word of his fell on the ears of Fungakolai like a drop of distilled lead. Punguzali wanted the old man to retaliate with harsh words. But he could not speak because his throat was blocked. Drops of distilled lead that fell in the ear came out through the eyes and hot tears appeared and burned the eyes. Punghuali returned without raising her bowed head. She walked towards the beach. The walk began slowly. Traffic increased. The dumb queen glanced in the direction for a moment. She saw Alwarkadian standing near her trying to convey something to her. She had a feeling that she should not be in a place where people are. I don't like hearing human voice. Cow! How cruel are humans! Why do they speak such cruel words? How good would it be if everyone remained dumb? After entering the forest for some distance, she reached the banks of Thondamana River. She walked inland along the shore. Marking the spot where she had left her boat, she walked. Yes, get on that boat soon. Get on the boat. Have to go to sea independently. The voice of men must go to the middle of the ocean. The oar should be left alone. The boat must float in the waves. He should also be involved in it. To be endlessly lost in the boundless ocean. Only then will his troubled soul find peace. 
the words of the general will relieve the anguish of the heart. Anger subsides and comfort arises. What did that wicked old man say? Cast a net and stop fishing in the sea. Don't cast a net for the prince. He said. I will lay a net for the prince. See you. Look at that old man's crazy behavior. Yes, fish living in the sea are better animals than humans living on land. They don't talk so cruelly. How blissfully time passes swimming and floating in the deep sea. What is their concern? What is the tragedy? Aha! Shouldn't I have been born as a fish in the ocean? If you were born like that, wouldn't you be able to swim forever in the deep ocean without getting caught up in the miseries, hatred, profanity and anger of this world? Then there would be no one to separate himself from the prince, or to deceive, or to speak venomously. No, no. That too is not certain. Even there these evil men will come and trap them and take them away. Even if they take only one of the two fish, they will go. Badass. The fury that surged through Pung Jai Lai's mind gave her feet an immeasurable speed. She reached the place where she had left the boat when the sun reached the summit. Good luck, the boat was still tied up where it had been left. Her soul mate was that boat. Her refuge was the boat. In this evil world surrounded by suffering and treachery, it is that wide boat that gives him peace and happiness. It was a great thing to leave it untouched. From now on, let it go anyway. Let the prince be guarded by that old general. Let him tie the woman of Kajumbalar around her neck. So what's wrong with me? There is my boat, there is a paddle, there is pain in the arm, there is also a vast sea. King of the ocean. No matter who else abandons your beautiful daughter, you will not abandon it, will you? You will not belie what Prince Thiruvanal said, Samadra Kumari? Punghuali boarded the boat. She steered the boat towards the sea. As she went with the flow of the river, she soon reached the mouth of Thondamana. Then she launched the boat into the sea. She knew that the whirlwind was going to blow in no time. She was well aware of the early signs of a tornado. On the first night, a grey circle was seen around the moon. The whole day today was a blur. The leaves did not move on the trees. There are black clouds in the southwest corner. A whirlwind is sure to hit soon. The turbulence of the sea is a wonderful sight. Do not get caught in the sea. It is better to go and stay at Puthu Island. If you stay there, you can have a good look at the Alola Kalolam created in the sea by the whirlwind. After the wind dies down and the roughness of the sea subsides a little, the boat can be launched into the sea and go to Kadakare. What's the rush now? Kadakare is probably gone by now. Fortunately, it does not get caught in the whirlwind. The prince would have landed safely all this time. Or perhaps he would have gone to Mamalapuram itself. Where have we gone? He will not be caught in the whirlwind, till then you can be satisfied. Or perhaps he would have gone to Mamalapuram itself. Where have we gone? He will not be caught in the whirlwind, till then you can be satisfied. Or perhaps he would have gone to Mamalapuram itself. Where have we gone? He will not be caught in the whirlwind, till then you can be satisfied. Punghuali did not know that the trees had spread their mats and could not go into the sea as the wind had completely stopped before the cyclone started. So she thought that she would have gone to a carry all this time. The general said, don't set a trap for the prince. That said often appeared in her mind and tormented her. Therefore, she thought that she should not go to Kadakare immediately. After staying on the giant island and enjoying the whirlwind, she decided to leave quietly. Pudadavya was not far from the mouth of Tondamanar, so she reached there within an hour of departure. Pungazalai was just in time to join Pudathivi and the whirlwind started blowing. After taking the boat ashore, tipping it upside down and tying it up securely, she reached a small Buddhist stupa at Punghualiathava. At first she watched for a while in the cave room at its base, protected from the wind and rain. She couldn't stay like that for much longer. A desire arose to see Lord Vayu's tumultuous pastimes. She came out of the cave and climbed the stairs and reached the top of the stupa. 
At that time the environment was similar to the state of her soul. The hundreds of coconut trees that grew on Bhutathivi stood around the Samharam Murti in a dizzying fashion like the Bhutaganas. The waves of the sea sometimes rose as high as those trees and presented a view one second like the snow-capped peaks of the Himalayas, and the next they fell apart into a hundred crores of foamy drops. The sound of the swirling wind and the roar of the waves and the occasional thunderclap made one think that all the thickets were collapsing. The lightnings appeared from time to time as if cutting the sky and spread out from the branches and branches and then disappeared. For a second, the stormy waves and the swaying trees were illuminated, and the next second they made them deep in the darkness of Conangria. Punghuali stood for a long time watching all the chaos. Her body swayed like trees swaying in the wind. Her hair was loose and flying in the wind. The rain drenched her body. The roar of thunder pierced her ears. A power cut took her eyes. She didn't care about all this. She stood there in the wind and rain for a long time. Her heart was raging with rage. She was proudly enjoying all the wonderful commotion happening around her, thinking that it was just for her to see and enjoy. From time to time she was reminded of Prince Aroma's Hivarmar. At that time she thought that he would stay in a safe place with Kadakar. Perhaps his parents even stayed at home, or maybe he went to Nagapatnam and stayed there in the royal palace. Maybe he was on a ship at sea? What if? What whirlwind would do to the great log he had climbed? Many people surround him to protect him. Will he remember about himself? Where is that demon Fung Uzali at the moment? Would you consider that? Not one day. She would think of Vandiyadeva sent by her sister. One can also think about Kajum Balar Gomez. Where is he going to remember this poor Karayar clan girl? After enjoying the whirlwind for a long time in the night, she went to the cave at the foot of Pungazali Stupa and fell into tears. She was restless in her sleep. She was dreaming something. She once dreamed that she was going on a boat in the sea and casting a net and a prince was caught in it. Another time she dreamed that she and the prince were transformed into fishes and swam side by side in the ocean. Waking up in the middle of each dream and asking, what madness is this? Thinking that, she tried to clear her mind and fell asleep again. When she awoke well in the morning, the tumult of the whirlwind had somewhat subsided. No thunder, there is no lightning, the rain had also stopped. She got up and went to the beach. The waves are not as big as last night. But the sea was still rough. Scenes were visible on all sides of what the previous night's whirlwind had done to Atiwa. Trees uprooted and lying on the ground, tall trees with their hair bent and hanging down, presented a scene. Pungazali was watching all the scenes when he saw a tree floating in the sea at a distance. After being tossed this way and that many times by the waves along the beach, it finally came to rest on the shore. It was then that Punghuali noticed that there was a man in it. She ran away and looked. The man who was tied to the tree was guilty. She untied him and relaxed him. He was a netizen from a coastal village in Elam. He said that he was caught in a whirlwind where he went fishing. He said that his companion was taken by the sea and his survival was reincarnation. He also delivered an even more important message. In the early hours of the night, a strong whirlwind blew and seemed to stop for a while. We were surrounded by darkness. Suddenly there was a thunderbolt. In the lightning that appeared, two trees were visible. One of the trees caught fire. We watched the terrible scene for a while. There was also a rush of people. Then it caught fire. The ship has sunk into the sea. Another piece of wood has disappeared into the darkness. Said the man stuttering. As soon as he heard this, he suspected that the ship that carried the prince to Pungazali might be one of them. She was sure that it couldn't be like that. There are many ships coming and going in the sea. What do we care about that? But some of those on board the burning ship may have fallen into the sea. One of them might be clutching at something caught in his hand and floundering like this lumberjack. Why don't we help them? Why not go on a boat and bring such floundering people ashore? Then, what is this birth for? That's it, whether this thought appeared or not, Pungazali untied the boat, straightened it, and threw it into the sea, 
she also got on. Using all the strength of her iron arms, she stroked the oar. It was very hard work till we reached the shore and crossed the crashing waves. Then it wasn't so hard, her arms ached from the paddle as usual. The boat swayed merrily and moved slowly. Bungaze Lai's heart was filled with joy. The old hymn that she usually sings on the boat automatically takes on a new form. Prince and Vandiyadeva holding the sail were floating together in the ocean. That night they floated in the sea. But to Vandiyadeva it seemed like ages. He soon became disillusioned, he has completely lost hope that he will survive. Every time he went to the top of the wave and came down, he thought, I'm dead with this. He was surprised to find life and consciousness again. Often he looked at the prince and lamented, I have put them in this danger with my hasty wit. The prince consoled him and gave him courage. He often said, there are people who survived by floating in the sea for three or four days. How long has it been since we fell into the sea? Vandiyathevan asked. It hasn't even been a night yet. Said the prince. Lie. Lie. It must have been many days, said Vandiyathevan. After a while he had another problem. Throat was dry and thirsty. He was floating in the water, but there is no water for thirst. It was great torture. He said to the prince. Be a little patient. It will be dawn soon. Let's go somewhere on the shore, said the prince. He waited for a while, could not sir. I can't bear this torture. Untie the chain. I'm drowning in the sea. He said. The prince again tried to muster courage but to no avail. Vandiyathevan was furious. He tried to untie himself. The prince saw it. He went closer and slapped him twice on the head. Vandiyadeva lost consciousness. When he regained consciousness he saw that it was dawn and light. The roar of the waves had also subsided a little. The sun must have risen somewhere. But I could not see where it had risen. The prince addressed him lovingly, friend. There must be a shore somewhere recently. I saw the top of a coconut tree a little while ago. Be patient a little more. He said that. Prince. Leave me alone. Escape somehow. Vandiyathevan said. No. Don't hear that. I won't leave you like that. Aha. Uh -huh. What's that? It sounds like someone singing. Said the prince. Yes, then they heard the song sung by Pungazali from the boat. The hymn rang in their ears like an anthem of danger. Even Vandiyathevan, who was exhausted and dejected and had lost three quarters of his prana, was revived and encouraged by the hymn. Prince. It's the voice of the flower girl. She's driving the boat. We've survived. He said that. After a while the boat came into sight. It came closer and closer. Pungujali, is this really happening? Suspecting that, she froze. The prince untied Vandiyadeva. First he jumped into the boat. Then he also lit Vandiyadeva. Pungazali stood motionless like Chitrabave with her paddle in her hand. 